Good morning, church. How are you today? Good. All right. Glad to hear it. If you have your Bible, I'd love to ask you to take it out, open it up, and head over to the book of Haggai. When was the last time you heard that? All right, Haggai chapter one. If you don't know where Haggai is, it's okay. The table of contents is inspired too. Head on over there, grab that. Find the page number Haggai's on. We're gonna be Haggai chapter one, starting in verse five. So as you're headed over there, a couple things. Number one, today is open house here at our church. Um, If you have children or students that are part of our ministry, you can meet their teachers, their leaders today. Um, We also, several of our ministries have tables set up in the commons. You can find out information about all the different ministries that are available here at Houston Northwest, maybe something that would help you or serve your family. There's also opportunity for you to sign up to serve, to help out, to volunteer. We would love for you to do that. We've also got popcorn and HTO over in the commons, over in the student building. So I hope you'll stick around, enjoy that, even after service is over today. Uh, Next, I want you to know, next week we're having a baptism Sunday. There's flyers like this that were in the seats as you came in. Hopefully you saw those. You can use that QR code to sign up. So Baptism is an outward sign of your inward faith. Now, we'll talk about this more next week, uh, but baptism doesn't save you, but baptism is the first thing that believers are asked to do when they come to faith in the New Testament. So in other words, once you come to faith, the very first thing you're asked to do is to be baptized. So if you're here today and you haven't been baptized, you might say, wow, I want to get my baptism done so that I can show that I'm obeying the Lord. Love for you to do that. We've already had 10 people sign up to be baptized next week. It's going to be a great day. Yeah, we should clap for that. Thank the Lord for that. It's going to be a fantastic Sunday. You too can sign up. Use that QR code there. If you have questions, reach out to us. We'd love to answer those for you. Um, And if you know someone who needs to be baptized, listen, next week I'm going to teach on baptism and your friends can just come. And if they feel like the, the Lord has brought them to a place where they're ready to cross the line of faith, they can do that and we can baptize them next week. So would love for you to set that aside. Now, one of the things that we asked our church on Wednesday and would love for you to do so Um, If you would be willing to fast one meal this week to pray for this service, we're just asking the Lord to do some exciting things. And so to bring people across the line of faith to join us in this. And so I'm going to ask that you'll join me in that prayer this week. All right, so um, the couple things I want to let you know about and excited about that. I want to give a a brief introduction to the Bible for those of us in the room who may be new to the scripture, new to church. Uh, The Bible is divided into two parts the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament tells us about God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, uh, the Jewish people, and how they're looking for someone to bring rescue for them. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see they were enslaved under the Egyptians, conquered by the Babylonians. Um, We get to later in the Bible, they're under the rule of the Romans. So they're always looking for someone to rescue them. They were looking for an earthly king. They used the word Messiah to describe this person, kind of an idea of a chosen one. We get to the New Testament, we find out there is a king, there is a Messiah, there is a chosen one. His name is Jesus, but he's not exactly what the Jewish people were expecting. Instead of being an earthly king who comes in uh, with an army, instead he comes in to take over hearts. And in fact, we discovered that the kingdom of God is not just for one small group of people, the Jewish people, but it is for all all people. It's a global movement. So anyone who places his or her faith in Jesus as the Messiah can become part of this new kingdom, this new movement. They use the word church, this ecclesia, this group to be set apart. So Jesus comes, born of a virgin, lives a perfect life, shows and teaches the way that we're supposed to live, and then dies on a cross. Now he dies as a penalty for our sins. So he takes all of our sin into his body and by that we're forgiven. But that wasn't the end. Three days later, he comes back from the grave and demonstrates that he is indeed the Messiah. So all of his earliest followers, they see him come back from the grave. They go and they tell anyone who will listen, we found the Messiah. It is Jesus. And if you place your faith in him, you can have forgiveness of sin, You can have the promise of eternal life with him in heaven one day. But in addition to all of those things, you can then have a way to live here and now. So those of us who are here in this room that are believers, we've inherited this faith and we continue to live it out. Now, Haggai was a prophet in the Old Testament who prophesied as the people were coming out of exile. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But he told them the way that they were supposed to live in response to what God wanted. 
So here in a minute, I'm going to read that and then we'll jump in and see what it has to do with us here today. So let me pray over us. Then we'll jump into Haggai and we'll see what the Lord has for us here today. So would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word. God, we know that you continue to speak to us. You continue to move. Lord, even today, I know that there are people in this room who need a miracle. They need to hear from you. Father, there are people who, they need to surrender their lives to you today. And so, Father, I'm just praying that I can exalt Jesus in such a way that Jesus will become the most important thing to them, the most glorious thing to them, and they'll run after him. God, let me show his, his treasure today. Father, I pray that your spirit would move freely. Lord, that, that our hearts would be stilled, that we would be surrendered to you. God, we love you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Haggai, chapter one, starting in verse five. Now, the Lord of armies says this. Think carefully about your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber, and build the house, and I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of armies, because my house still lies in ruins, while each of you is busy with his own house. So on your account, the skies have withheld the dew, and the land its crops. I have summoned a drought on the fields and the hills, on the grain, new wine, fresh oil, and whatever the ground yields, on people and animals, and on all that your hands produce." Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, so the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we're about to change the way we greet each other, aren't we? You know, it's that time of year whenever you say to people, how are you doing? And instead of saying good or fine, they say busy. Right, here we are, it's back to school. If you are a parent, you already know this, your school forgot who your child was a year ago. They sent home 50 forms. You had to fill them out again. You filled out the same forms a year ago. Here it is. It's time to sign up for soccer or t-ball or band or football, or karate, or whatever it is that your family's into, and they're going to sit with a straight face and tell you they need you at 17 practices, and they need you there all day, every day, and if you're really committed, then you're going to be there. And we get signed up for all those things, so it's kind of crazy to me, as I thought, you know, now that I'm quote-unquote an empty nester, this stuff slows down, but I talked to some of the folks in our church who are retired, they tell me they're busier now that they're retired than they were whenever they, whenever they had kids at home. There's something about the American lifestyle. We just like to run fast. We're in this series called Buy a Thread. And the reason that I want to talk about this today is because last week we talked about grief and loss, very real. This week, I want us to talk about redlining. A lot of us are running our lives at an unsustainable pace. You know it, I know it, we all know it, but it's almost like a badge of toughness or honor to just keep on going until we run ourselves into the ground. And there's this thing that I think we have to talk about that many of us are hanging on by a thread because intentionally or not, we cut all the other cords. And we need to hear from God on this. I think the words from Haggai chapter one are actually pretty essential to us today, pretty important, and I think they'll speak directly to the American condition. This year, I want us to focus on spiritual health, 
And as we think about this, I want us to remind ourselves that one of the great thinkers of the faith, uh, Dallas Willard, who was a professor at USC, professor of philosopher for many years, whenever asked about the most important quality of Jesus, he answered, unhurried. How many of us could say we're unhurried? I mean, we're rushing from place to place, trying to get stuff done. And I want us to just look at the words of Haggai and see if the Lord could show us some truths today. So, let's start with where many of us are today. Many of us are frustrated. You see, this passage is talking about a time when Israel had been in exile. So, the Babylonians came in, conquered Israel, 587 B.C., destroyed the temple, and carried them off to a foreign land. Now, if you've ever heard and been in church, you may have heard stories like Daniel in the lion's den, or maybe you heard a story like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Those stories did not happen in Israel, in the promised land. They happened in Babylon when the people had been conquered, captured, and carried off into captivity. But now they're back. The temple's been destroyed, and they're trying to rebuild their lives they're trying to build houses again, trying to plant farms again, trying to start over in a land that has been completely eradicated. Now, the people are frustrated. You can hear it. Listen to this verse 6. This is what verse 6 says. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. And who says this? The prophet Haggai, but it's God speaking through Haggai. Verse 5, the Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. God says, so, looks like you're having a tough time. Can anybody here read verse 6 and go, man, I relate to that? I mean, maybe you, you're not planting crops, but maybe you read that and you go, yeah, that, that makes sense. As I was reading this to me, two images came to mind that to me describe the American condition perfectly. Number one, a hamster wheel. Anybody ever felt like you're on a hamster wheel? You get up in the morning, you make the coffee, you head to work, you do your thing, you come home at night, you make dinner, you do whatever family activity you do, you watch an episode of some show on TV, you go to bed, you get up the next morning, you do it all over again. And you're like, I didn't really get anywhere. I just did it over and over and over and over. Anybody ever felt like that? Yeah, on the hamster wheel. The other image that came to mind was a carousel or a merry-go-round. It's like you're looking around and there's this like music being piped in and the horses seem to be smiling at you and everyone's kind of got a glazed over happy look on their face, but at the same time, the ride goes way too long. It just never ends and it keeps going and going and going and you're thinking, I'd like to get off of this merry-go-round, but I don't really know how because someone else seems to be in control. I think a lot of us are running, going nowhere fast or we're on a ride that we wish we could disembark. And whenever you read verse 6, I think I see three areas there that the Lord speaks about. The first one, work. You've planted much, but harvested little. Anybody here ever worked hard, so hard, and he just never really felt like it was satisfying? What about pleasure? He says, you eat, but you're never satisfied. You drink, but you never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but they don't keep you warm. Anybody here ever gone out thinking, man, tonight I'm going to go out with my friends, have a great time. You hit the club. You go do whatever, and then you get back the next morning, and you're like, man, that, that didn't really fill whatever that hole was. Oh, if I can go on that trip, that vacation, man, then I'm going to feel great. And it's great while you're there, and then you get back, and the same people you left are still there whenever you get back. <laughs> or the clothes, right? How many people here, man, I've had a bad day. Maybe I should pull out the credit card and get online and buy something. That'll make me feel better. Or then the last one, right? Not just work, not just pleasure, but money. I love this image. The worker gets his wages and puts them in a bag with a hole in them. It's like they get the coins, they put them in the, their money bag there, and they're walking, and coins are follow, falling out as they're walking down the road. Any of us here feel like I should have plenty of money, but whenever I go check the bank balance, it's like it's all gone. I never have enough. 
Now, the Lord is speaking straight to the American condition in my mind. And the thing that's so funny is, is that people are chasing after work. They're chasing after pleasure. They're chasing after money. And they're never satisfied. Heard a story about a man who bought a horse ranch, struck oil, sold it, became a billionaire. And he would buy more things, more investments, that sort of thing. One of his friends talked to him and said, why do you keep doing that? What more do you need? And his answer, more. I heard a story about some millionaires playing golf, standing on a green putting, and one of the men in the foursome told the other three that he had recently purchased a new golf stream. Now, the other three all had jets, but theirs weren't as good as the new one. And immediately, they were jealous and wanted that. And we think, well, at least I'm not like that billionaire. At least I'm not like those millionaires in their jets, right? None of us turn on HGTV and suddenly have to redo our bathrooms, do we? That doesn't happen. Anybody here ever hopped on Pinterest so they could get ideas for their kid's birthday party? And then you failed. Have you looked up the Pinterest fails, you guys? These are pretty great. Have you seen like the one of them? That's the cookies in the waffle iron, the waffle iron cookies. Like, man, we're going to nail it. And then not so much. Or maybe you've seen like the deviled egg chicks that are supposed to be cute, but they come out kind of demented. <laughs> or maybe you've seen the minion cupcakes. I don't even know what that thing is there, right? <laughs> and why do we do that? We do that because like... I would talk to Joy and she'd be like, well, you know, I want to be a good mom. Like we put these weird expectations on ourselves. If my bathroom doesn't look like Chip and JoJo just walked out of it, then I'm not up to snuff. If I don't have the Pinterest perfect cupcakes, then I'm not the parent who cares. If I don't have the jet or I don't have the job or I don't have the right address or I don't have whatever, I'm frustrated. And the Lord says, you will never be satisfied chasing those things, ever. So what do we do? Well, we need to get off the hamster wheel. We need to hop off the merry-go-round. So what do we do? The next thing in this passage, we have to reorder. We have to reorder our hearts. You see, God answers the question for the Israelites and really for us. Why are they frustrated? Why are these things not satisfying? Look at verse 9. The Lord tells them. He says, because my house still lies in ruins while each of you is busy with his own house. What does that mean? The temple had been destroyed and the people, for whatever reason, had been there a long time, but they had never gotten around to dealing with rebuilding the place of worship. Instead, they were only focused on their house. They were only focused on their jobs. They were only focused on their farms. Nothing to do with the Lord. Now, whenever we read this, the application seems pretty clear. A lot of us are frustrated because we're chasing after things, and we are not chasing after Jesus. We're chasing after stuff that we think will be good in our house, but we're not thinking at all about the Lord's house. Now, here's kind of the interesting thing to me about this. Sometimes you read this, and you know, people are like, well, I thought that, you know, the first ministry that we're supposed to have is to our family. First Timothy chapter five, verse eight. But if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Hey, 100%, believe it. Everyone should take care of their family. If you're married, got kids, you should take care of them, you know, et cetera. But here's the thing that's important for us to hear today. If you care for your family to the detriment of loving the Lord, you actually are out of order. And if you get out of order, you will always be frustrated. You see, the problem for many of us, I think, is that we have things that we love, but our loves have become disordered, and the Lord Jesus has fallen to the bottom. Here's something that I want us to think about. How many of us in here have obsessed about where we're going to live, how our house is going to look, what we drive, 
How many of us obsess here about the clothes we're going to wear? We want to look right, want to be fashionable, fit in. How we look, we get to the gym, work out. And then after all of that, you know, we got the 2.3 kids, we got the golden retriever, we got all that stuff. And then at the end of that, then we go, you know, I guess I should probably go to church. You know, like God, Jesus, church becomes this thing that's expected of people who are quote unquote good people, but it's not the thing that's driving our lives. You see, in this sort of mindset, Jesus is just something we sort of add on. He becomes like a mix-in at Marble Slab, right? You know, we're, yeah, I get some Oreos, throw in some Reese's there. Well, probably I'd have a little Jesus, throw that in there too. It's just something that sort of becomes the thing that we do, maybe because it's culturally expected, maybe because we think that it's something we know that's right. But Jesus says, I want to get top billing in your house. And if he doesn't get top billing, here's the crazy thing. No matter how successful you are, no matter how good things look on the outside, you will always feel a deep dissatisfaction. Now, here's the funny thing. I'm saying this and a lot of y'all are going, I don't have time for Jesus. You know how crazy my life is? And that, of course, is our warning sign, right? Have you noticed, I know I've noticed, have you noticed that as Christians become more affluent, as Christians become more successful, church becomes less important? And whenever you're broke, church is free entertainment. Go see some folks, right? Man, get there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and they might have, you know, an ice cream supper or have some food that they'll throw out. The good thing, but then, you know, once you got some money, man, I got to get to the lake house. How am I going to use that boat I bought? And what's really weird is we chase after these things that are American dreams, and in doing so, we don't even intend to do it, but we just let the priority of the Lord slip down the ladder. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus gives a very short parable. I thought it was fitting because he talks about a house. Therefore, Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed the great crash. Last week, I stood up here and I talked about if your life blows up, if you've got faith in Jesus, you can still hold on to him. But what happens if you haven't built your life on the foundation of Jesus? When your life blows up, you know what you're holding? A bag with a hole in it, and it's empty. And I would say that if the church is to be countercultural, if the church is to be different, we have to not be afraid to prioritize things differently from the rest of the world. Everybody else may have the coolest this or the neatest that, but our first devotion has to be to find satisfaction and love in Jesus Christ. My question today for our church is this, is Jesus what we have built our lives on or is Jesus just a cross we hang in the hallway, right? I mean, I can come into a lot of our houses right now with some of, we have cross walls, right? We've got 30 different styles of crosses hanging on the same wall. Right next to where it says, live, laugh, love, we've got, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, right? I mean, we've got... Those Bible verses there. But here's the thing I want to ask you today. Is Jesus your foundation or is Jesus just a decoration? Is Jesus this thing on which you've built your life or is he just something you sort of hang up to be cutesy so that people think you're a pretty good person? A lot of us today are stressed out and a lot of us are redlining because we have the wrong perspective on the Lord. You see, the storms are coming, and we're crumbling, and we're thinking, well, you know, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. And it may not be about doing anything. 
It may just be that we feel dissatisfied because we haven't made Jesus the thing on which we are standing if everything else around us falls. I'm not a psychiatrist, but my layman's mind understands that the response to redlining, to being highly stressed, is basically the same reaction that people have to PTSD, which is what? That your prefrontal cortex disengages from the decision-making process and you revert to lizard brain, which is a fancy way of saying you just react. You just react. Have you ever wondered why it is whenever you're quote-unquote stressed out, whenever people get on your nerves, you just snap at them? Right, the prefrontal cortex has been disengaged. Right. It's not so much that we have to do anything. It's actually that we probably have to do less. Do you find it any wonder that God hardwired into his word and into us that we need every seven days to worship and to rest, to build in margin. The rest of the world, they can go 100 miles an hour all day, every day, but their prefrontal cortex is gonna disengage. You see, whenever you've got margin, whenever you've got space and you run up against those things that are hard, what can you do? You can breathe a five-second prayer. Jesus, be with me. Jesus, help fix this thing that I can't fix. But if you're completely disengaged, where do you end up? You end up in a place of frustration, anger. You even start to blame other people. Why would they do this to me? How could this happen to me? Instead of recognizing, I'm not where God wants me right now. C.S. Lewis famously said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Is Jesus your lens for seeing the world? If you lost your job, if you lost your spouse, if you lost your house, if you lost anything, would you be able to say, I've got the rock of ages? Here's some questions maybe we should ask ourselves today. When my life is difficult, do I go to God in prayer or do I complain to others first? How often do I even stop to pray? Whenever my weekend is busy, am I looking for a way to just skip church? Do I have a desire to learn the word of God? How often, or how do I feel rather, about serving others when there's nothing in it for me? Do I have deep relationships in church or do I just slide in the back and head out as soon as service is over? These aren't the only questions and these certainly aren't the questions that may diagnose all of us, but I think they just start to show us where do I prioritize? When I reorder things, where does God fit in? We've gotta reorder things. Guys, my garage has been a wreck for five years. I mean, it looks terrible. And I've just gotten to where I can kind of strategically stack some things. It's crazy because the rest of our house looks pretty organized and together. You open the door of the garage, you're like, wow. I don't know who's going to clean this, but I feel sorry for him, right? <laughs> it's that kind of a thing. We started finally yesterday, right? So yesterday, we were like, okay, this section right here, we're going after it. So Joy and I got out there, and we cleaned it. Now, here's the crazy thing. Do you know, I can sit on TikTok and watch organizational videos for hours. <laughs> but my garage does not get clean until I put on some work clothes and go out there and sweat a little bit. A lot of us are sitting here right now. And yeah, Steve, I hear you. That's good. But are you going to do anything? Did you notice what Jesus said? He didn't say the wise man, he, he, I'm sorry, when he said the wise man built his house upon the rock, who are they? They were someone who heard what he said? No, no, no. They were someone who heard what he said and put them into practice. If you just hear me and you walk out here like, man, that was a great sermon. Or man, I learned a new Bible verse today. Or man, I didn't know how to pronounce Haggai. I always wondered that, you know? <laughs> like you walk out of here with some kind of Bible knowledge, that's great. But if you don't do anything, you don't have the rock. And so what the Lord is asking, yeah, so what the Lord is asking us today, what the Lord is asking us today is, will you hear and will you obey? Because that's what disciples do. So we're asking you to reorder. The Bible word is repent. It's turn towards Jesus. Do the things that God is asking you to do. Now, this is not a guilt trip. This is not me trying to tell you what, you know, to make you feel bad so that we can get more help in the preschool department, okay? 
This is me saying this because I see so many families in our community and in our church of people who are burned out and frustrated because they can't figure out why they're tired running on the hamster wheel. And the answer is because until we reorder our lives around Jesus, we will exhaust ourselves. We can move from frustration to reordering to being satisfied. Did you know that you can be satisfied with God in a way that you can be satisfied with nothing else in the world? I love this verse from Psalm 63, verse 5. You satisfy me as with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. David says, when you are satisfied in the Lord, you can feel like you just went to grandma's house and had a homemade chicken fried steak, mashed potatoes with cream gravy and a slice of pie. That's how you feel afterwards. You just feel satisfied. You couldn't eat another bite. You've said that, right? I couldn't eat another bite. That would be you saying, I don't need a thing else because I'm satisfied in Jesus. You can be that satisfied. Now look at this next verse. Psalm 63 verse 6 then says, when I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches. Wait a minute, what? David gets in bed and thinks about football? No. Gets in bed and thinks about sex? No. Gets in bed and thinks, how can I get the next promotion? No, he gets in bed and he meditates on the characteristics of God. He thinks about the satisfaction that he can have in the Lord alone. Where does your mind go when you get in bed? Where does your mind go when it can be anywhere, when it can wander anywhere? I'm going to tell you something. Wherever your mind wanders, when it can go anywhere, probably will tell you the place where you find your comfort. What do you do with your time, with your hands, when it's the end of the day and you can do anything? Oh, man, Captain Crunch and Netflix. Retail therapy online. How crazy would it be to be like, I just want to think about God's goodness and character and kindness. Why would anyone do that? This is what I want you to hear. You would do that because once you have truly tasted the grace of God, nothing else will satisfy. Have you ever met Christians who are jerks? Yeah, everybody's like, yes, I'm sad that it's that easy to answer, right? But do you know why I think a lot of Christians are jerks? Is because they've gotten so consumed with doing stuff for God that they've forgotten the goodness that God gave them. Just through his spirit, through his love. God is with you. That's what we read, right? Remember, they repented, they started building, and the Lord says, I'm with you. You see, the idea of spending time focusing on God's house is not so I can give you more church activities. It's not so you can get burned out or get on a different hamster wheel. The idea is, is so that your heart can be stilled and you can experience a satisfaction that you will get nowhere else. The scripture tells us that God pursued us in Jesus, that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin, that Jesus rose from the dead so that we might have presence with him in this life, through our forgiveness of sin, and then presence with him in the next life through the resurrection and the promise of eternal life. And if you have tasted a God who will receive you and love you in spite of everything that you've ever done, you now begin to understand the goodness of that God. What else could ever satisfy? You're never going to be satisfied by a six-figure salary. You're never going to be satisfied by having you know, a smoking hot spouse. You're never going to be satisfied because you've got a Maserati in the garage. You're not going to be satisfied because you finally got to go to Bora Bora. You're not going to be satisfied because you finally got to move into that neighborhood. You're not going to be satisfied because you got to write that book or get that degree or be achieved in whatever way that you think. The only thing that will satisfy you is the spirit of the living God given to you through Jesus. Let's stop chasing junk. Let's start going after the Lord. You see, the problem with all of those other things, whenever we go after the whiz-bang of dopamine, as Seth Haynes says, whenever we do that, what happens? It always wears off. <laughs> Captain Crunch and Netflix feels good until it doesn't. Right? 
That nightcap in the evening, man, you start thinking about it a little earlier in the day. Just looking to take the edge off. You see, what's funny is, is I've discovered over the years, a lot of people love to judge people who are addicted to chemical substances that are outlawed when really they're addicted to just to stuff that's legal. The only thing that will ever satisfy the cravings of the human heart is the love given from a God who sent his son and filled us with his spirit. That is the only thing that will satisfy. What if today you could find ultimate satisfaction? What if today you could find a way to stop exhausting yourself, to stop wearing yourself out, to stop trying to live vicariously through your friends or through your kids, What if today you finally recognized that you could be satisfied because Jesus became a foundation rather than a decoration? What if today you would finally decide to build your house on the cross and the empty tomb and a God who cares about you? If you did that, you wouldn't be frustrated anymore. You would feel satisfaction. Satisfaction in Christ is the goal. And it's given by God alone. And I want you to have it, but it can only come if you place your faith in him. If you haven't, and if you have, and you've lost it, turn back to him. Give him top billing in your life. And return to the place where instead of saying, busy, you can say, I'm satisfied. Would you pray with me? Lord, for my friends in this room who have yet to say yes to you, I just want to pray for them. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I've never said yes to Jesus, but today's the day I want to say yes to him, would you just raise your hand for me? I just want to pray for you. You're like, right now, I'm ready to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus. I'm ready to place my faith in him. Would you raise your hand up so I can pray for you today? Just raise it up high where I can see it, if you don't mind. Who's ready to place her faith in Jesus today? Okay. Okay. Who here would say, hey, you know, Steve, what I need to do, I just need to be baptized. I haven't haven't done that. I've said yes to the Lord, but I've never done that. I need to do that today. I need to be public and say I'm building my life on Jesus. If that's you, would you raise your hand? It's time for me to do that. Just raise it up. Okay? Who else? Just raise them up. Okay? If you're here today and say, hey, Steve, I've, I've placed my faith in the Lord, but I've been distracted by other things. And Jesus has not received top billing in my life. He's been a decoration rather than the foundation. I want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand? Okay. Anybody who would say, yeah, you know, he's always been the foundation, but I've just, I lost my way somewhere along the way. I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you. Okay. Father, we come to you today, each of us, responding in different ways. Some through placing faith, some through deciding to be baptized, some to return to you, some to give you top billing again. Lord, some, multiple of these things. God, we come to you today and we say, be our satisfaction. Father, let us today recognize that hanging on by a thread doesn't have to be the case because we can be held by you. God, let us be held by you in this moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So glad that you joined us online today at Houston Northwest Church, where our vision is to make Houston more like heaven by helping Houstonians become more like Jesus. If you have questions about following Jesus or would like to talk to someone about next steps in your spiritual journey, text Know Jesus to 281 946 6500. Connect with us throughout the week by following us on social and enjoy a great day.